Hi everyone, um, welcome to our latest event of uh, climate change and where we are. Um, today we're, we're really lucky to have Guy Vince um, talking to us and taking questions from you. Um, she's an award-winning author and broadcaster and speaker um, and she's going to take questions around the, the subject of her latest book, Nomad Century. Um, and um, the book outlines pretty much almost all the climate adaptation measures I've, I've ever heard of, if I'm honest, and it's incredibly comprehensive. Um, but also it primarily focuses on um, how we can manage climate migration to make it a genuinely adaptive strategy to the climate crisis instead of it being seen as a, a problem to be solved. Um, so um, we're just going to, um, yeah, before, um, we're just going to dive into, I was just going to say a bit of, um, bit of housekeeping to say that um, if you want to post any questions, there is a Slido link in the show notes underneath the video. So post them in there. Um, if you're subscribed to the channel, you can, you know, comment in the comments box on YouTube as well. Um, we'll be monitoring that if there's any technical issues or anything. Um, so let us know. And um, yeah, without um, wasting any more time, um, just hand over to Gaia um, to say welcome. And um, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, wade in for the first question about um, climate migration. Um, firstly, we've got um, Alison Briggs here, um, and she mentioned, how do we pers persuade the majority of the global population that climate change will be um, have severe negative impacts on their lives? Um, when we have a lot of issues around social media um, talking talking up the positives all the time. Um, hello, it's great to be here. Great to be talking to you all. Um, and thanks for your interest in this really important subject. Um, there's a lot of social media talking up the positives of climate change. I, I'm, I'm actually not aware of this <laughs> at all. Um, and I, this is a this is an area that I uh, cover quite comprehensively. Um, there are there are a few um, positives to come out of climate change um, in terms of the weather. I should just apologise for my voice, which is kind of going today. Um, the the um, temperatures uh, make it uh, better for expanded agriculture, for example, in the far north. Um, but there is nowhere on earth that will not be experiencing huge negative consequences of um, extreme weather events, of uncertain and unreliable uh, weather systems, and um, all the repercussions that come from the global temperature rising um, over the coming decades. Um, and that, that includes everything from coastal erosion um, to do with sea level rise to the fear that we could um, cross tipping points in um, the Atlantic current systems that drive the Gulf Stream, in um, uh, ice melt in the Greenland ice sheet. Um, in, in there are there are countless uh, really really negative consequences of climate change, and I must say that um, in my experience they have absolutely dominated the headlines. I haven't seen a lot saying climate change is great, so I'm 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 a bit unclear <laughs> where that's come from, but perhaps I can be corrected, and maybe there is um, a big a big thing on that that I haven't seen. Sorry, no, I'd have to agree. Um, I know that there are some. There's a lot of um, issues on social media at the moment around um, with Elon Musk taking over Twitter now, and there's a lot of misinformation on Twitter has started happening now. So um, I mean, I agree. There's a lot. There's a lot of climate denialism saying climate change isn't happening, but I haven't seen much saying climate change is going to be great. <laughs> um, I'll just go in with one of uh, one of my questions. Um, I was just wondering. This is obviously a really, really difficult issue to um, to talk about, and obviously climate change is a really tough issue to convince people of the need to act on it. Um, but obviously, with migration or immigration more specifically, it's almost like a house of cards because we're so kind of predisposed, as you outline in your book, pretty really clearly that um, people are people are focused or very, very easily turned to thinking that immigration is really bad. Um, do you in and when we have when we talk about climate change ourselves, um, it's often hard to convince people of taking certain actions or, or paying attention to what's going on. Um, do you for have any experience of having positive conversations with people about um, talking about talking up immigration and migration generally? Um, so it's true that in um, you know in our species in, in Earth's history we are um, we have this kind of paradox that we we tend towards tribalism. Um, and of course, tribalism um, entails othering of um, other populations and other people. But at the same time, we absolutely rely on networks and um, cooperation across tribes and um, globally throughout throughout the world. I mean, that's what's allowed humans to become this um, 
this African ape that has colonized the entire planet. Um, we've done that through our networks. Um, we can, none of us could survive alone. And we, we actually um, cooperate with complete, complete strangers. And if you look at the genetics um, across populations and across our species, you will find that um, the idea that there are any ethno-nationalists or um, that there are any, any piece of land has belonged to a certain uh, population um, uniquely or anything like that is, is garbage. I mean, we are so interbred. We have basically uh, spread our genes is a nice way of saying we've sort of shagged our way across the world, essentially. And this tribalism, um is is one facet but it is overcome constantly and continually um throughout our species because cooperation is more important to our survival than conflict um so um in in terms of that um what we live in now is a very globalized society where even if you don't um migrate yourself you're reliant on um, everything around you that has migrated and is is um, the product of this joined up networked world. Um, so we are sort of undertaking these these secondary migrations all the time. Um, and and when we look at um, government policies, um, there is this recent tendency towards nationalism and towards ethno nationalism and populism and um, this kind of demonization of immigration and immigrants. But actually. Um, if you do surveys of populations, you find that they are not nearly as nationalistic and not nearly as xenophobic, certainly as um, some of these leaders. And um, we, the, the polls are actually showing um, an increase in desirability of immigrants, especially as we face these demographic shortages and these huge labor needs, um, which, have been, uh, which have been exacerbated by border control policies like Brexit or whatever. Um, which means that we have now shortages of everything from care workers to farm labourers to dentists to um, truck drivers to pretty much everything. So uh, yeah, as, a, as a result, people are becoming um, a much more favourable, especially in cities, much more favourable to the idea of um, immigration. And um, most economists are pushing and, and kind of crying out for um, that to solve a lot of our problems, or at least uh, lessen them. Great, thanks, Kaya. Um, I've just got the next one, which is, is pushed up the, the list on Slido. Um, recent UK leadership has focused on economy, not environment. Do you see greener decision making elsewhere? Um, well, so it's a complete fallacy to separate the economy from the environment because the economy is entirely reliant on our environment and as our environment changes that is extremely um, detrimental and has huge impacts on the economy and um, likewise the economy can um, improve or um, or de destroy our environment so they are completely intertwined and most governments realize this now and have policies in place for what's being called in some places green growth or um, um, the plans for um, an economy which is based on the huge energy transition that we're currently undertaking. I mean, it's hard to see it because we're right in the middle of it, but we are undertaking something that is far bigger than um, the Industrial Revolution was, this move away from combustion, from burning stuff to um, other forms of energy. It will change everything about uh, our societies, our economies, um, our, our environments. So... Um, so yeah, um, countries that have cottoned onto that um, are of course, you know, leading the way. I mean, if you look at somewhere like, for example, Costa Rica, a very small um, Latin American, you know, Mesoamerican um, nation, which is sort of sandwiched in, um, in between many pretty dysfunctional states. Um, and yet they are achieving incredible, um, incredible uh, factors from education to health to growth and their economic growth is based on um, extremely stringent and strong environmental nature protective principles and laws that are in place so they are the only country to have reversed deforestation they actually um, now protect 
um, a large portion of um, their land for nature. Um, they are net zero in terms of energy. They're 100 percent really renewable pro provi provision. Sorry, in terms of their power, in terms of electricity. And they have many plans in place to um, decarbonize other aspects of the um, energy system of the, of the economy from um, transport to industry to agriculture. And they're paving um, a way ahead of that that are then you know that that is the future for them and for um the you know it's a future for all of us but they are really leading away there and if they can do it um a small developing nation um there then certainly the rest of us can do it oh that's a really interesting point about costa rica isn't it it's uh, christiana figueres it's like her father was president or something i think and she's obviously closely linked to everything that goes on there from her you know leadership of the um, the IPCC and uh, um, those parts of things. It's um, yeah, it's a great success story. What's happening in Costa Rica? Um, I mean, one thing you mentioned there was about um, economic growth, and this is something that obviously um, you know lots of people in the climate space are quite anti-growth. Um, but there's always this economic environment um, argument to say that that's the only way we can get people out of poverty. Um, what do you say to people saying that we should be pursuing pursuing zero growth or negative growth because of this you know finite system that we live in and we can't have endless growth in, in that system. Um, I would say we need growth to escape poverty, absolutely, um, and to give people meaning and purpose um, and uh, opportunity in their lives. But what we don't want is um, uh, economic growth that destroys the environment, which is kind of what we've had for well most of most of human history, but particularly in the last century or so. So we need to decouple. Um, economic growth from environmental destruction and that is starting to happen um, it's already it's already happening in terms of uh, carbon emissions in some places um, but we also need to be aware of what we mean by economic growth because there are lots of different definitions and um, GDP is quite a poor marker of economic growth um, in terms of in terms of the economy and also in terms of environmental stability um, environmental sustainability because a lot of things um, that that would be classed positively in terms of GDP are actually extremely destructive and when we look at destructive of the environment um, when we look at growth we need to recognize that growth is um, an increase in the quality as well as or um, the quantity of production. So we don't want to just get fixated on quantity. We also look to look at quality. Um, and so if you look at it from that metric, you would say that, for example, um, a malaria vaccine is um, an increase in growth because it increases the quality um, of life. Uh, so, so we do need growth, but we need to be careful about um, what sort of growth we have. That's that's really key. Um, one of the things that people are talking about here, actually, um, and I should have done this at the beginning, I suppose, really, but um, just like a brief synopsis of, of what your book is about over and above it being about migration. I mentioned that it has um, stuff about all parts of all of the solutions to climate change. It's incredibly comprehensive. Um, but would you like to talk about that a little bit quickly? <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, I guess it's a very pragmatic book looking ahead uh, from where we actually are now, which in 20, early 2020s, um, and looking at where we're headed. So um, at time of writing, um, a year or so ago, uh, that we, we were looking at um, probably heading for about three to four degrees the very best we could have hoped for is probably about 2.5 degrees realistically looking at um looking at uh climate models and i did this in conjunction with scientists at the uk met office and um elsewhere by the end of the century something like three to four degrees um and that changes everything um about our society where and how we live if you look at the planet um, as a whole, once you start reaching higher temperatures, and we're, we're expected to hit 1.5 degrees. Well, we'll probably hit it briefly next year, um, but um, consistently and um, and often we will hit it certainly um, within the next sort of um, six to eight years. Um, the the um, the globe, if you look at it as the temperature goes up the areas that become habitable or remain habitable for our species 
um, completely change. They shrink. So there will be a large band across the tropics where for months of the year, um, in many places for large populations, it will not be livable. So people won't be able to adapt to these much higher temperatures. Um, they will have to move. And that's um, also true of coastlines, of rivers, of some of our most populated cities. Um, places that will remain um, uh, livable, um, certainly with adaptation, everywhere will have to adapt to this um, changing climate. Um, are towards the northern and southern um, hemisphere, but essentially that where the land is, that means um, northern latitudes. So uh, we need to think about um, infrastructure for a larger population. The population anyway is already above 8 billion and it's going to go up to 9, possibly 10 billion. Um, it's expected to peak somewhere in the 2060s and then um, come down again. Um, so it's a huge upheaval this, this um, century. And so you know, we need to change everything about where and how we live, how uh, how we get our energy, how our entire food systems, um, where the water is, our infrastructure, our housing, our um, building materials, everything is going to have to change. Um, and at the same time, over this century, we have to restore the planet's livability. That means, you know, in uh, reducing the carbon intensity in the atmosphere, um, it means reducing the temperature of the planet. It means restoring um, uh, wildlands um, and biodiversity, because at the moment we're facing a huge crisis there, which is also affecting us. Um, so the jobs this century are, are <laughs> it's quite a lot, shall I say, a huge upheaval. So Nomad Century is really my book of, um, it's a manifesto for how we can best survive this um, and so I come up with uh, various solutions which I think would work um, and you know I don't agree I don't expect everyone to agree with these solutions at all but um, I want to raise this because I feel like it's not being talked about properly um, we're not facing up to the reality of what we are about to experience um, and what that means for us and we're not um, we're not being given the various choices that we still have um, and as a democratic society, we could vote for different solutions and we could make sure that we are planning, that we have a vision of what we want um, in 2100 or whenever. We, we want a vision of a livable future and then we take steps to achieve that and ideally um, democratically as a society rather than um, just retrospectively kind of acting in emergencies when there are huge climate events that um, destroy lives and livelihoods and we have to suddenly uh, react to that. We don't have any choice um, at that stage. It's far too, it's far too urgent. Um, and so, you know, then leaders have to take decisions um, with, without these, these processes being followed, this, this discussion, this conversation about what we want as a society and what we want to um, work towards. Just to follow on from that, do you think, I mean, this is obviously really expansive and it's a really, really difficult um, point to really embed in people. I mean, it's, I find it quite, I gravitate to it quite, quite easily. I've, I've lived in lots of parts of the world. I've got family over the world. I've, you know, I've got my, my, my grandmother's Indian. Um, and um, it's, I'm quite open to all of these ideas about being inclusive and having people from all over the world come and move around openly. But um, do you think this is, as it's so easily shot down, have you, have you um, worked with anyone um, on kind of broadening the idea outside of your book or thought about doing a podcast or anything like that to keep the conversation going? Um, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> it's a good idea. I, I wouldn't know. I don't I don't really know how to set up a podcast and, and, and do those sorts of things. But yes, I mean, we do need to have discussions about this, about our future, like proper discussions, not not um, not these very, very kind of closed mind, conservative mindsets where we where we don't imagine change and we don't we don't fully accept the reality of what we face. We have to we have to be open to what is coming and also be open to the various solutions and the various options so we can explore them in our minds and explore them as a society um, through talking about them before we commit to actual policies.
you along those directions. Um, at the moment, we have a lot of mixed messaging about everything from climate change. You know, one minute it's fracking and opening coal power station. Next minute we're committed to net zero and, you know, um, we're, we're the greenest government or whatever. You know, we, we need we need some sort of consistency um, as a nation in what we are all aligned to and what we're what, you know, what what we're all trying to achieve rather than um, this this very. Um, disjointed messaging and disjointed kind of um, policies, you know, this is far too important to to leave to sort of whims. Yeah, I agree. Um, maybe we can't rely on governments to deal with this. Maybe we have to start, you know, talking about it more ourselves, which which leads on nicely to a very popular question here which is what are the most beneficial conversations we can be having with members of the general public, family or friends? I think it's important to, to start the conversation along, uh, along really imagining the future. That's quite a difficult thing to do. You know, many of us haven't made our own wills. We haven't, you know, we don't save, we don't plan very far into the future. But, you know, it is inevitable. The future is coming. Um, temperatures are going up. So when you imagine the future for yourself or your children, um, what, what does that look like? And what does it look like when the planet is hotter? You know, what, what are you prepared to tolerate um, in your life? Like, is it OK to have um, fewer immigrants, but be wide open to basically a higher level of conflict because um, people are moving? Or is it better to, to think about ways that this could work for everybody? I mean, in my opinion, it's much better to, to plan for um, a larger migration. It's also, it's also, you know, it's a false economy, for example, um, not rolling out renewables as fast as we can now because it will cost more in the future and um you know this is all tied up as well with um social injustice um in our own populations you know who is in fuel poverty and who isn't but globally as well of course so so my conversation would really be you know what do you want in your future and i think most people want clean air water that's clean and not swimming in sewage um, they want um, they want more vibrant um, wildlife, uh, wild areas. You know, um, they want plentiful food that is affordable. They want energy that is affordable. And you know, the good news is, for a lot of these things, it's not only doable, but we're actually moving. You know, we could be entering an age of cheap, abundant energy if we roll out our renewables faster and. Um, and and more widely, you know, this it could change everything. It could disrupt a lot of things, a lot of systems, in a way that makes most of us, um, you know, our standard of living go up rather than down. So, you know, this transition is already underway. We're already moving this way. But what is what what do you want to see and in the future? You know, where are we going with this? Because I think at the moment we're very short term uh, because partly through necessity, you know, it's it's how much money you've got in your bank account or in your purse at the end of the month, you know. Um, so decision decision making is 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 restricted and is conservative. You, you have to, you know, lock it into those um, in, into that small parameter. But I would ask you to look a bit further and a bit broader. You know, think about things, ways you can make a difference as an individual, for example, like where is your pension invested if you have a pension? Is it invested somewhere which is helping this global transition or actually harming it? Um, you know, think about think about the kinds of foods that you're eating and how you can how you can change that to become more sustainable and think about where and who you're voting for. That does um, follow on interestingly to, to like the, the next um, question from Zubin Nayak, who it's says, um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, Ellie. Can I just jump in with another follow on? Yeah, to please that do. Yeah. Last question. Um, 
I think some people feel a sort of a sense of paralysis when, you know, the 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 whole idea of climate change is is thought about or talked about. Have you got any advice for for people that experience that? Yeah. So what we're facing is enormous. It's it's absolutely huge. It's global. It is overwhelming. There is no doubt about that. It's it's huge. It's much bigger than you or I or any of us. It's a really big transition. And a natural response to that is to kind of cower or hide and just try not to think about it because, it, you know, you can't, I can't do anything about the big climate problem. Neither can you. Um, or, or go down a whole denial route um, or just become very despairing. Um, that's another reason I wanted to write this book. I wanted to say, you know, all is not lost, right? The f it's not necessarily a dystopian future. When we think of the future and when we see it depicted by, um, by artists or filmmakers or, or authors, it quite often is a dystopian future, but it doesn't have to be, okay? We have agency. We can choose various paths. And that's what I want to say, you know, we're, we're, we're living at a very unfortunate time where there is very little vision from our leaders. We don't have very many visionary leaders who really kind of can think ahead and, and convey this narrative of what a better future could look like. What is a good Anthropocene and how do we get there? Um, so I, I would really like us all to, to you know, to, to do this project where you do think ahead, right? Imagine yourself older, uh, where are you living? What does your house look like? What does the street look like? You know, well, for one thing, you're very unlikely to be walking along, breathing in car fumes, you know, at toddler height anymore. Right. We're going to be solving that problem just as we solve the, you know, sitting in the pub and then, you know, you can hardly breathe because of cigarette smoke. So there are there are changes coming. Um, you know what? How would you like this? How would you like this um, future to unfold and how do we get there? What does it actually mean? It's, you know, there are things that we can do that can make it a lot better. It is going to be an upheaval. There are, is going to be, you know, there are going to be tragedies. There is already, you know, huge loss of life. There is already large amounts of climate migration. Um, you know, it's more than three million people were displaced by climate events last year alone in America. Um, you know, more than 30 million in a week in Pakistan. This is happening already. How can we make this better? And there are ways to make the future a better future. You know, it's all is not lost. So um, I really hope this book is pragmatic and hopeful and, um, and galvanizing, you know, to actually think about, about the solutions that we have right now, we have them. So, um, you know, <laughs> this, this future, this, this electric future could be a lot better. I think that's a really important point um, with regards to the energy transition that we're going through at the moment. And, you know, if we think about it in reality, it does represent an absolutely massive shift in the way we are functioning as a species. You know, it's no longer extractive anymore. I mean, obviously, for the resources that we're going to use to make that equipment. But at the same time, almost all of that's recyclable. And it's, you know, this could be this could be us based finally um, moving into that world where we do have like really abundant energy and it wouldn't happen for a few decades but as you mentioned in your book you know once you once you have like masses of clean energy it starts to change what we think is a viable option to do at the moment like cost is underpinned by the cost of energy um, and that basically limits so many of the things that we're not doing at the moment um, so yeah, it's like we're going through this, um, yeah, as you say, this, we're at this inflection point at the moment and, and things are going to look very different, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but as you say, it's uh, we have got a difficult century ahead of us. Um, one of the interesting questions that's popped up as well is um, about little, um, just this is a nice one really from Zubin Nayak. Um, um, what, what kind of micro actions can you take to support immigrants and refugees um, as they integrate into your into our societies? Yeah, so those of us who live in cities are already very, very familiar with the idea that that we, if not us, but certainly most of our neighbours and work colleagues and friends and people um, we meet at the school gate or wherever, 
come from all different places, even if they didn't come themselves, they're second generation. They can, that's what cities are. They are entirely built on immigration. So this isn't something very strange for us at all. Um, but in terms of making things better for immigrants and, um, and how they can integrate, you know, we need to have that conversation. Uh, we need to change the narrative. I mean, immig immigration is not a security issue. It's not immigrants, people who move are not criminals or bad people. We, we all move, very few of us are living in the house that we were born in, we've all moved. Um, and many of us have crossed borders to do so. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually not a weird thing at all. Um, and we need to change that narrative. We need to, we need to counter it when we hear it. Um, you know, whether it takes the form of racism or um, whatever, whatever other um, strange sort of prejudice people put um, to, to immigrants. And, you know, we depend on immigrants. We depend on immigrants to look after the poorest and the most um, needy in society. But also, you know, when you go out and you want a drink and you don't want to wait in a bar for, you know, hours to be served that's because immigrants are coming to help with that you know at all all levels of society whether it's a brain surgeon or somebody clearing gutters you know we rely on people with different skill sets um, in our societies and they are part of our societies we need to see them as part of our societies you know if you live in london these are these are new londoners right um, like we are londoners and london's face changes over millennia over centuries and um, it becomes stronger, more multicultural. We get fusions. We don't lose whatever the intrinsic uh, quality of being a Londoner is, whatever that is. You know, um, we still have that, but we add to it. You know, we add to it with different foods, a fusion of foods, of music, of culture, of conversation, of um, patents filed, of innovation, um, of everything. It's, it's, um, it's the mark of a progressive productive society we um and we and we need to start that conversation from kindergarten to um to the oldest in society we need to change attitudes um that are that are prejudiced for no reason against um certain groups of certain people yeah it's really interesting i remember back in parts of your book where you talk about is it some american cities that have they've still got a legacy of advantage from having ways of immigration come like over a century ago in terms of um you know educational attainment and employment um it's like there is there's so many metrics that you know that are, are, are better just by by allowing this to happen as you say like so much of our culture is created by the things that we well the, but the things have been brought to us from other cultures um, yeah, I mean, if anything makes Britain great, it's um, this infusion of people who want to come and help make Britain great. Um, and, you know, um, economically, there are so many studies that show the value and importance of um, increasing that labour force and, um, uh, you know, with immigration and and how it improves productivity, how it raises um wages, how it reduces unemployment, all sorts of things like that. Um, but, you know, for immigration, certainly on this kind of scale that we're talking about, for it to succeed, it needs policies that help that. It needs um, financial investment and it needs social investment. So it needs financial investment in housing. So there are enough houses for people, healthcare. So there is access to a GP and, you know, um, you don't have to wait longer because the population has expanded, um, education, all of these things. And at the moment, um, many governments are not, um, are not providing that for their existing population, let alone an expanded population. But that is a policy choice. Um, so vote for a government that you know, makes better policy choices. Um, in terms of um, the important investments socially, that is in this inclusive message. That's absolutely key. Um, if you look at, for example, Sweden's got a very generous refugee policy. So, um, you know, lots and lots of um, refugees live in Sweden, but they didn't um, invest in that very important social 
um, side of things. So as a result, what's happened is there are kind of segregated communities, siloed communities where the, um, the migrant community don't feel Swedish and the Swedes don't think of them as Swedes. And you get this kind of black market economy. Now that doesn't help anybody's economy at all. Um, black market society, essentially, um, you get the rise of the far right, you get the rise of crime um, in the migrant community. And, you know, we can do better. We really can do better than that. And really what my book's saying is this is already inevitable and underway, this um, climate migration, even if it's hidden among other nominations like um, nomenclature, sorry, like um, um, economic migrants or or, um, or or other definitions um, because climate change is a threat multiplier it's, it's lots of things kind of combining to make people move but you know many of the people that I've met around the world that have moved you know if you move from your village where you uh, live have lived you know with your family um, for generations um, in an agricultural livelihood and then you experience repeated droughts you cannot live there any longer um, and you move to get a job um, in a factory or um, in, in a city in a slum somewhere you know you're classed as an economic migrant but the reason you've made that move is for climate right because the climate has changed and made where you live unlivable and I've seen so many of these depopulated deserted villages everywhere um, and it's it's a mixture of things but it is being driven by this um, unlivable climate. And we're going to see more of that. And I think it's much better to acknowledge this now and understand that populations will enlarge. How can we do this? How can we plan and manage this um, transition, this movement um, that is already happening in a way that is not panic induced and is not um, going to cause huge conflict and up too much upset um, in the, either the host or the rec receiving country, you know, uh, or the country of origin, you know, how are we going to do this? And there are plenty of strategies. I mean, I, I sort of detail very many different options in the book, but, um, you know, people who move, you know, at the age of sort of 20, in their early 20s, that is a, a fairly um, standard time to move. It's less of an upheaval. People move to university, from university, to get jobs in various places. Lots of people are moving at that time. It's easier to fit into a community. Everybody's looking for new friendship groups and um, uh, work groups and so on. So communities are formed at that age. And, you know, that's a good time to move. So training and education for um, uh, to move people at that time. And then they can find create the jobs and the supportive networks to then bring family members over or um, or, or uh, and to send remittances back to help with adaptation back home. I mean, this is this is um, a, ge a much gentler way of doing things. Um, That's yeah. a really interesting point that you were also making in your in your book about that. You know, it's not just us brain draining other countries of their skilled workers as well. Um, I went to a presentation last week, and there was a, an academic from Bristol University, physicist, does lots of climate, um, does lots of modelling, not climate modelling at all. Um, but uses lots of um, you know server time, and they've engaged with um, they've engaged with some people in um, Somaliland, um, who's very well networked with internet. They've got wind and solar, um, and so Bristol University does all of their or, or most of their um, or most of their processing um, over there, and then obviously the data just comes back through the internet. Um, and also they're now upskilling people there. So they've got, I think, 300 people at Bristol University works with and educates. And they've got this program that's kind of ongoing. As you say, like you can, can have, I mean, it's one of those things where the disruptive power of kind of the way we're um, running, um, obviously, energy there as well, but data too. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, part, it doesn't have to be partitioned by, by borders necessarily. And you can have these two-way streets where everyone can benefit. Exactly. And, and you know migration but also all of human problems are solved through cooperation through these collaborative networks that we form and by creating them um across geography as we are now able to do because of the internet and because of the types of communication technology that we have um, we can then ease the kind of physical movement of people and solutions to a lot of these problems as well because they become part of our community that we they're colleagues right um, I think, you know, this is the sort of thing that we need to develop more and, and it also develops understanding of different groups, you know, who on paper might look completely different. But of course, you know, we, we're all part of the same, same human on a changing planet scenario. 
And you, you've talked about you talked in your book about some countries that get this or getting this right or planning for the future, um, like um, Canada. Um, what, what's what's Canada doing um, in regards to this? And and what could you and have have you had any engagement with um, people working in this kind of area, policy area and stuff in, in the UK on on those kinds of solutions? So Canada is planning on trebling its um, population um, over the coming decades. Um, it's got a, you know, it's, that's it. That's the uh, government's intention, and uh, you know, it's it's largely supported. Um, and so they they are bringing in um, a, a large number of immigrants every year, um, mainly from Asia at the moment, but that's expanding. Um, and it has plenty of policies in order to help integrate um, people uh, into much more inclusive sort of societies. And these are new Canadians. They're part of this new um, sort of project of Canada to become a bigger, a bigger nation. Um, I mean, it's going to have to become bigger than that even. But if you think that the existing population um, is going to be, you know, if, if it trebles, it's going to be um, uh, smaller than the by proportion than the, than the bigger, you know, it, it seems very strange that many countries in Europe are, um, you know, having these huge kind of like cultural implosions about a few migrants coming in boats um, who are actually asylum seekers and we have a, an international obligation to protect, you know, let alone kind of trying to, trying to make this work economically, socially, culturally, um, for the country, which is what Canada's doing. Um, that's one thing that's interesting as well, because you talked about Germany, I think, as well, um, at one point, and how they obviously welc welcomed like um, over a million refugees um, from Syria, I think. Um, my sister was living in Germany at the time, um, and they noted like animosity growing towards these people who were being housed near them. Um, and But now, obviously, Germany's starting to benefit from having those, those immigrants coming in. Um, it really is starting to pay pay dividends. Um, but um, along along those lines, um, over the next century, I've got a question here about um, to to what extent and how many people are likely to be forced to become, say, genuinely nomadic or or, or forced um, to leave their countries by by climate change. Well, I mean the the models change um, in terms of their predictions. So, um, and it, it it depends on lots of things. Um, so it varies from sort of tens of millions to one and a half billion by 2050, for example. They're, they're quite um, a large difference. And it depends on things like, for example, how much mitigation we do. You know, if we really get a grip, um, uh, fewer people will have to migrate. But also we could do geoengineering, which would reduce the temperature um, and mean fewer people would migrate. Um, also um, adaptation, you know, how much money and funding is going to that at the moment, it's it's not enough. Um, and that can help people stay for longer um, or stay in places that they would otherwise otherwise have to leave. Um, and it depends on also how, you know, how easy countries make it to move to safer places. Um, a lot of people who die or who are massively displaced by climate disasters um, are living in places that are known to be unsafe and vulnerable um, but they either don't have the money to move or they don't have um, the means or it's it's too difficult for one reason or another to move somewhere safer um, and that that needs to change right people have a right to live somewhere safer and governments should be doing everything they can that people don't want to move generally because of that all important network, social network that you have, you know, that's where your friends and family are. This is where you can get um, someone to, um, for childcare or to look after an elderly relative or help you get a job or um, speak to your language or, you know, whatever, they, it's important. And this is the land that you own, quite often your only wealth in many places. So, um, you know, there is a lot of reluctance to move and, while I think we should all migrate a lot more than we do because it's very healthy and ex expands our cultural um, knowledge and you learn know, new languages and, and all sorts of other things. You know, the idea that people have to move because their environment is unlivable um, is, is an absolute tragedy. And, and these people do have to be helped. Um, we have this in our own country, you know, people who are living in um, essentially condemned villages because the coastline is eroding. 
they are reluctant to move. They're quite often not offered packages that um, that would help them buy a property of similar, you know, of similar value or similar um, um, enjoyment somewhere else. Um, so it's it's difficult. Um, they can't sell their house and move because they, no one can get insurance for it. No one's going to buy a property that's basically um, condemned. Um, you know, it's it's a big problem everywhere. And, and this is something that we all need to, you know, we need to prepare for. And I really don't think that these kind of conversations are happening at all. You know, if it wasn't for the Thames barrier, we would be inundated all the time in London. Um, luckily, that's going to hold for um, for longer um, and protect us. But that's the kind of forward thinking adaptation that we need a lot more of um, in places. We need to have decisions. We need to have conversations about what places are worth saving and adapting and what places should be abandoned. And they should be democratic decisions, you know, because these, these, this, this is our um, future. <laughs> going to move to something a little bit more economic again now. Um, this is a question from Isabel Alonso. You have already mentioned this measure of GDP, but she asks, what are the chances of changing GDP as a measure of growth worldwide? Some, brackets few, economists are looking at wider measures, but it is not happening fast enough. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there are a lot of um, economists and there is a lot of movement to change that definition of GDP, actually, and to look uh, more widely um, at it. I mean, essentially what is happening anyway is that we are bringing in penalties for, for example, um, uh, carbon emissions, which which shifts um, the GDP benefits of certain activities as well so it's kind of it is kind of happening but yes i agree it's it's very slow and um and you know we we need far better uh, regulations to to protect um you know biodiversity to protect our atmosphere and oceans from um increased emissions and our health um and and that's that is sadly lacking everywhere you already mentioned Costa Rica. Do they measure their economy differently? Um, so they have different they, they 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 have different scales. But yes, they measure. I mean, it's measured in GDP as well. But it's um, they they have sort of built into their constitution various things that you know um, a certain amount of um, of uh, the land, a certain percentage. I think it's about twenty five percent is um is absolutely protected and not allowed to be developed for anything and that sometimes comes in conflict with um a clean energy policy for example like you know if they want to um if they want to develop further their um geothermal energy from using the volcanic volcanic resources they have that's actually really difficult they've got some existing but if they want to expand that they would have to because these volcanoes quite often are um are located in areas under conservation you know, um, if they wanted to expand that, they would have to go through so many hoops and everything to to make sure that an, a similar um, of equal value um, land is conserved somewhere else. You know, so that they're you know, they are facing their own challenges, but there are certain things that are so embedded um, in the Constitution. This idea of net zero, this idea of clean air and clean water is so um, embedded in the psyche of. The people, you know, people are very proud of uh, this concept um, of of kind of green growth is what we call it here. So um, we call it la pura vida, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, they're, it's, some, it's, they're some of the happiest people in the world, aren't they? The Costa They are, yes, yeah. yes. They are, they, they are happiest and also longest lived. Um, you know, the, the Nicoya Peninsula part of Costa Rica is one of these blue zones. Um, there are a few around the world where people live longer. So um, it is an unusual country. And I think one that, that more people should pay attention to because they've managed to do this with a functioning democracy um, through, through policy and through making choices about what and how they invest. Um, and you know, they're not a rich country. They certainly don't have anywhere near the resources that this country has. 
Um, and they were an absolutely one of the most deforested countries um, in the world, in the tropics, certainly um, in Latin America, the most, you know, absolutely deforested. And they made a conscious decision that they were going to reverse that and they were going to protect it. And they've done it and they are doing it. Um, you know, uh, Britain's <laughs> Britain's biodiversity is pretty shocking. We We could learn some lessons from this. We are certainly, I've heard that many times, we have one of the most degraded land masses in, in the world. And every time I look at pictures of the Lake Districts or anything, I, once I kind of heard that and understood that um, argument or point, I can't, I just look at it now as like a, like what I would, I would envisage a deforested part of the rainforest, you know, when I was a kid doing geography. Um, it just looks like a naked landscape to me. And yeah, it's quite disheartening to see that kind of thing. Um, but obviously you can see there are places where there have been successes and um, even in the UK we've got rewilding projects and stuff that are looking to, that they are making a difference, they've been running for a couple of decades now, there's a few in Scotland as well, isn't there? But um, um, one, of the, one of the ideas um, that's come up here as well is about, um, I know we've got the, the carbon border adjustment um, is happening in Europe about, you know, charging people more when they want to um, export to Europe um, if they don't have good carbon or climate policies. Um, there's a question here about um, how the international community can influence other nations who are not taking steps to reduce emissions um, and protect their natural assets. And obviously, carbon border adjustment is one of those ways. But are there are there, are there other ways? Or yeah, I mean, know? definitely, um, carbon price is absolutely important, and it should be, you know, it should be much higher up, and it should be really um, enforced because it's it's the heart of the problem, um, and. And also a lot of the injustice that's going on at the moment, um, it, it, it would help somehow um, to alleviate some of that. So that's that's really important. Um, yeah, I mean, when when we move to different forms of energy, a lot of these problems will actually become a lot less. And, and you know, we are we are at this um, in this transition at the moment. And it, it does seem very difficult and big, but actually, you know, this renewable rollout that we're experiencing at the moment is far faster than I could have imagined. Um, you know, I mean, it's still, you know, not like half as fast as it needs to be to meet any um, of these net zero targets. Like it's it's nowhere near that. But it is becoming, I think, pretty much an exponential curve um, at the moment. And I think we've probably passed a tipping point now, a social tipping point rather than an earth system tipping point in terms of... Um, it, it, renewable rollout you know it's now uh cheaper to build a new solar or wind power station than it is to um to keep supplying an existing coal fire, fire power station in many parts of the world i mean that's that's extraordinary that that pace of change will speed up and it will feed back into everything into food systems in terms of you know things like recycling for example a lot of recycling um, isn't done or isn't done well because it's just too energy um, expensive to do it well you know as these as these costs come down we're going to see um <laughs> sorry um a, a transition you know a transition in 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 how we relate to um the natural world I mean, that, that leads on um, to the next question quite well. I'll just kind of dovetail those together. Um, there's one about George Monbiot and his thought about um, 3% of annual growth leads to um, a doubling of the economy in every every um, 24 years. Um, but again, like if you look at the carbon emissions, um, I've talked about this quite a lot, really. But if you look at the carbon emissions of, you know, almost all the Western societies, they are now they are now decoupling growth from carbon emissions because of, say, renewable technology. Um and also a really interesting, I listen to a lot of... Um, that's what Lee I Brooks. was talking about when we talk about growth, you know, that's really essential. Once, you know, growth per se isn't, you know, it's the, the environmental effect and the social effect um, that we need to we need to watch and we need to decouple um, damage there, yeah. Do you think that the redistribution of wealth is going to be um, a big answer to the question or do you think that's more of a social perception issue? Is it that bad that we have people who are extraordinarily rich in the world i mean i think it's completely obscene i don't think i think even the concept of billionaires is i mean it, it actually disgusts me i think it's really gross i mean you just you know you just don't need that amount of energy but also it doesn't even affect your life you know beyond a certain amount of money you take some away it doesn't affect your life at all that money you can't 
physically use it you know <laughs> it's it's just um it's just making other people's lives misery because of the way that it's invested or because of the power dynamics that it's being used for um you know and inequality many studies have shown that um inequality of the level that has been it has been growing is damaging um for society for environments for um health for educate for for pretty much every um um every outcome that you look at it's it's bad for um and again you know that's poor policy that has allowed that i mean i think there should be wealth taxes and i just think it's i really do think it's completely obscene that we have billionaires let alone multi-billionaires and they have an absolutely outsized impact on our democracies our societies you know everyone from elon musk to um bezos um, they have these very outsized um impacts on the rest of us which is very undemocratic it's interesting thinking about the productivity side of things as well i was listening to a podcast with uh, michael Libra. i can't remember who's interviewing but it's his latest one and they were talking about efficiency and they tried to bang on about the efficiency of energy how we lose almost two-thirds of all the energy i think probably more than two-thirds of all the energy that we produce just through inefficiency and how productivity can be increased um by just making what we the energy we use much more efficient reducing the losses of our say you know we've got notoriously the most um leaky heat um heaky, yeah, leaky um housing and infrastructure in, in in europe um so it's uh I just to um, lean into one of the other questions. Um, I mean, and- that's true. You know, like wastage of anything um, is is bad, essentially, because once you waste stuff, you're you're throwing it away and you have to replace it. So it does increase productivity um, to a certain extent. But at the same time, the you know, there is this principle that as soon as you increase efficiency in something, um, your demand goes up anyway. You, so um you know we find that with everything from motorways you know you add more lanes they just get filled by more traffic you know if you're trying to solve the traffic problem but that's the same with energy efficiency if you lag homes um people turn their thermostats up a bit because it's cheaper to heat um to hotter levels and things like that but at the same time right there there is a limit to this and the more you insulate, the less you do have to um, heat to get to um, a good temperature. So uh, ultimately, you know, people shouldn't be living in homes that are so cold that they um, can't dry their laundry and are suffering black mould and other absolutely disgraceful Dickensian um, circumstances that many people are living in at the moment. That's, um, in my view, it's, it's, that is a, a disgrace. Um, so you know people need access to energy but they also need to not be paying to throw money into the sky so it's yeah it's both of those things and you know once once energy becomes much cheaper because you have done the heat pump rollout you have got a solar panel on your roof and it's very well insulated well you know you've kind of solved that problem (laughs) um top one is an anonymous one um what are your thoughts on migration as an adaptation strategy to climate change well i mean that's what i've been talking about you know um humans and and in fact all life migrates away from um environments that are unsafe Um, and always have done you know as ice sheets expanded um, populations retreated or used those as ice bridges and when the ice retreated populations expanded and we see a migration going on in um, plants that's actually measurable and and of course animal populations because of climate change now Um, and it's a established survival mechanism for um, all species and the many of the plants and animals Um, that will be negatively affected by climate change, the reason will be because they cannot migrate away because of human infrastructure. We've built a road or we've separated habitats or put a city there or whatever. Um, They cannot migrate away from unlivable climate. And it's the same for people. You know, if we put border restrictions in the way, um, you know, whether it's forcing people to, you know, take 
unsafe boat trips or 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 live in um really hostile conditions we're doing exactly the same thing in, in relation to the example of canada that you gave earlier is their ambition to triple their um population is that is any of their thinking behind that in relation to climate change adaptation um, most of it is is um, economics, but also they're taking advantage of the fact that although although Canada is already and will increasingly experience negative effects of climate change, they're having heat waves and droughts in, in the centre, a lot of their agriculture is affected and so on. Um, they are also going to be net winners from climate change. They have um, plentiful water resources, lots of places that are currently too cold and unlivable now will become more livable um, in coming decades. Um, they, they're able to grow um, food in different places. Um, they're gonna have access to um, the new Arctic North Sea Passage and all the trade across there, which is going to give them new wealth. Um, and, you know, they're a democracy with strong institutions. They're economically um, um, a wealthy country, so they can adapt much better than other places. So, you know, it's um, all of that comes into um, the all of that comes into the equation when it when it comes to looking ahead to the future. Well, we've uh, we've come to the end of our we've overrun our hour slightly, um, but just to say um, thanks thanks very much for taking all of our questions. Um, well, not quite all of them, but almost all of them. Um, it's been really informative. Um, and just to, just to reiterate, I've watched and listened to loads of people talk about their books, um, and I've only ever read a handful of them. But this one's def definitely genuinely worth worth reading. Um, obviously, the population situation that we're in and the migration issue is really really huge. Um, but also, there's so much more in there. Um, and it isn't, as you say, like um, I did. I did find it a very positive read. It starts off laying out the problems, but you know, it's largely about solutions. And um, yeah, so um, thanks very much for for talking um, about all of it. It's been really interesting. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Yeah, I do hope that you read the book and and um, and and think about some of these solutions and bring them up with your colleagues and um, communities that you come. You know, start threading some of these ideas into into conversations that you have because um, we do need to start talking about this. Just as we finally started talking about things like R numbers with COVID and um, and we're talking about you know heat pump coefficients or well maybe that's just me, but like you know. This needs to be part of our common parlance now a lot more, I think. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.